There's a passage where the Buddha compares a meditator, a good meditator, to a thoroughbred horse. And one of the characteristics of a thoroughbred horse is that the horse tells himself, whether or not the other horses are going to pull, I'm going to pull. Same way a meditator says, whether or not whether or not other people are practicing, I'm going to practice. This is a quality we have to keep in mind. There are two implications here. First, of course, is that the horse has a duty, and it's determined to do its duty regardless of whether anybody else wants to do the duty or not. This is an aspect of the Buddha's teachings that's often overlooked. Years back, I was sitting in on a class when someone was explaining the Karaniya Metta Sutta, and came to the first line, this is what should be done by someone who aims at a state of peace, or as a hand. Someone said, wait a minute, I thought Buddhism didn't have any shoulds. And the teacher spent the whole morning trying to explain how Buddhism might have a should. Actually, it's quite simple. It doesn't require a whole morning. The Buddha's shoulds are conditional. In other words, if you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you have to do. Now, whether you want that or not, he's not going to impose on you. After all, he's not your creator. He's simply someone who's found the path and recommends it. But his path is definite enough that he can say with complete confidence, if you don't do it this way, you're not going to come to an end of suffering. So it's not a matter of which aspects you like or which aspects you don't like. And for the Buddha, this was a, an important part of his teaching. He said if you felt that your actions didn't make a difference in your life, you were left without a refuge. In other words, you were left without an idea of what should and shouldn't be done. So this is one of the aspects of taking refuge in the Buddha, is taking on his shoulds. Having the confidence that he wouldn't lead you astray, he wouldn't recommend that you do anything unsafe or that wouldn't work for putting an end to suffering. You know, the two categorical teachings that he gave, the only two that he listed as categorical, have some shoulds. The first one is that Unskillful behavior, whether in body, speech, or mind, should be abandoned, and skillful behavior should be developed. The other categorical teaching is the Four Noble Truths. And they're not just idle truths or things you can think about, they're truths that carry a should. Suffering should be comprehended, its cause should be abandoned. The cessation of suffering should be realized, and the path to the cessation of suffering should be developed. These are shirts that carry across the board. That's why they're categorical. It's not just a matter of fashion or style. I was reading just yesterday someone talking about how they would have gave eight lifestyle choices, as if right view or right right mindfulness. The others were on a par with right diet and right exercise. I mean, you take a diet considering the, the style of life you want to live, you take an exercise considering the style of life you want to live, but you know, right view, right resolve, all the way down to right concentration, these have nothing to do with style. They're not aesthetic choices things that should be developed. There's a moral aspect to this. This may relate to the part of the, our modern culture that doesn't like the idea of moral rules. But again, these are rules that are imposed conditionally. Given the way cause and effect work in your life, if you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you've got to do, whether you like it or not. And the Buddha says the sign of wisdom is able to talk yourself into doing things you don't like that you know, however, will lead to good results. 
You know, start to talk yourself out of doing things that you'd like to do, that you know will lead to bad results. So we can't simply go by our taste or our moods or the fashions that attract us at any one time or another. There, there are shoulds to be done. That's the first implication of the, the analogy of the horse. The second one, of course, is that you can't wait for everybody to get on board before you start. The world is made a better place not by getting everybody to agree to something, but by individual people taking on their duties, knowing what should be done and then carrying it through. And whether other people carry it through with them or not, that's not the issue. You stick with it. You know this is right, this is the way. Or at least you have confidence this is the way. And there are results that come up in your practice that show that your confidence is not misplaced, but you carry through. I was reading recently a poll that said that 95% of Americans agree that national parks are a good thing. And the pollsters were remarking that this is one of the few issues that you could get that large a majority of people agreeing. My question, of course, is what about that 5%? We can't wait for everybody to get on board with what's right and what's good. But we can set a good example, and even if other people don't take our example, we ourselves can take comfort in the fact that we know we're doing what's right. And it may be that other people see our example and follow through, like that horse, the first horse to say, well, whether or not the other horses pull, I'm going to pull. The strength of that horse's determination is what can convince other horses that maybe this would be a good thing to do. At least that one horse is doing it, I'll help. But good things in life, the good things in the world, are started by that attitude of the first horse. Whether or not people, other people carry through, I'm going to stick with what's right. So this should give us the encouragement to keep on going, because the world is composed of individuals, and individuals have freedom of choice. And it's a fact that we don't often take into consideration. We like to think that there are mass movements where there's a force that's pushing the world towards what's better and better. But the Buddha never took that as, a, as an assumption. Each of us has the choice to follow through with what's right or not what's right. But that's what makes the whole act of teaching a path, something that's, that makes sense. And people couldn't make a choice, so why teach them a path? We felt that you know, the forces of the world would somehow move everything in the right direction. We can just kind of sit back and rest and just go with the flow. But you look around, you see a lot of the currents in the world are going in really strange directions. You can't trust just what's flowing. You have to have a clear sense of what's right. And even though Buddha, the Buddha did talk a lot about change, he didn't say that the Dharma would change. The Dharma is a principle that underlies everything else. It's the way things change. It's the laws about how things change. Those laws don't change. As he said, this rightness of the Dharma is something that's always the same. Once you look at the Dharma to see what's right, and then you compare your actions and your, your thoughts, your words, and your deeds to see where you can bring your actions into line with this long-lasting principle. So you have a good foundation inside that you can be confident that what you're doing when you follow right. Right action, right speech, right livelihood, all of the right factors of the path. You're not just being blown around by the currents of the world of the latest fashion. It's something you know this really is solid. And you look at what the Buddha has to teach. It's all good things. Things that have the solidity of goodness to them. When you're suffering, why is your suffering? If you place the blame on other people outside, you're not going to see the real causes of suffering, because it's something that happens inside. 
you're acting on ignorance, and as a result you're doing things that are causing harm, causing suffering. Well, you can bring knowledge to that. and turn your actions into a path to the end of suffering. The right resolve, the resolve to go beyond sensuality, the resolve not to be harmful, the resolve not to have ill will. These are solid, good things. The principles of right speech, no lying, no divisive speech, no harsh speech, no idle chatter. Those are principles of solid goodness. Right action. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex. Right livelihood. Not gaining your livelihood in a way that harms anyone. The right effort. Give rise to what's skillful and to abandon what's unskillful and to get yourself to desire to do this. These are all solidly good things. Right mindfulness, right concentration, these are good qualities to develop in the mind. And that goodness doesn't change. But when you look around and see other people are not doing it, you can't let that set you back. You have to respect the fact that everybody has freedom of choice. You're, if you wait till everybody agrees that this is a good thing, well, the world will probably come to an end before that. Goodness has to start within each of us as we take responsibility for our actions. As John Sawat used to say, each of us has only one person, i.e. ourselves, that we're really responsible for. And the best way to show respect for other people's responsibility for their, their actions, as the Buddha said, the best way to benefit them is to try to convince them. They should practice as well. Now, whether they follow through or not, there's a lot there that's beyond your control. But it's interesting that when he talks about benefiting yourself, it's when you abstain from harming other people. We tend to think of that as benefiting for them. But he said, this is how you benefit yourself. When you get them to do something that's beneficial for themselves, i.e., to stop harming, that's how you benefit others. In other words, you regard other people not as objects of your goodness, but you see them as potential agents of goodness themselves. So in this world where we all have the choice to follow the path or not follow the path, you can't wait until you get the majority on your side. Remember, the world is made a better place not by everybody agreeing on something. It starts with a few individuals. After all, the Buddha, look at him, he was one person who gained awakening. If they were taking a vote at that point as to what was the best thing to do in life, the Buddha would have lost. He would have been in the, by far in the minority. But he didn't let that dissuade him. And he taught the first time. He taught just five people. And then it grew to a few more, a few more, got to sixty. He sent them out to teach. It was a small group of people from the beginning. But the solid goodness of what they had to teach and the solid goodness of their own attainments is what has allowed this teaching to last. So as you meditate, think of yourself as that thoroughbred horse. Whether or not the other horses are going to pull, I'm going to pull. It may happen that other horses join you, and it may happen that they don't. But at the very least, you've taken care of what you can be responsible for. You've done something good for the world. And whether other people acknowledge that or not is not the issue. Because that goodness is solid in and of itself. 